What are we doing here? Why is it so important to kill this Dracula anyway? Because he's the son of the devil. I mean, besides that. Because if we kill him, anything bitten by him or created by him will also die. I mean, besides that. Welcome to Transylvania. Cinderella story. You want answers? We're on a mission from God. Inconceivable! Take your sticking paws off me! I'm afraid I can't do that. Have fun storming the castle! Hey everybody, welcome to Story Cauldron, finding the folk tales, fables, and philosophies behind your favorite Hollywood films. I'm Bobby the Movie Dude. I'm Anthony the Philosophy Guy. And I'm Garrett, and I'm here. And this is the podcast where we watch movies and talk about the cinematic stories. Well, the stories behind the cinematic stories, actually. We, we look at the, the myths and the fables and the fairy tales and the philosophies and, and all of the, the messy collection of ideas that get smushed together and squirted out into every new tale that we tell. Woof. That mm-hmm. was definitely a poetic way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to use the word squirt. In a way that doesn't sound poetic, if you ask me. Well, today we're talking about the original version of Universal Pictures' Dark Universe, Vampires, Werewolves, and Sort of Zombies. Oh my. Oh my. It's Van Helsing. (laughs) Yeah. So let's start with the movie itself. So Gabriel Van Helsing is a monster hunter employed by the Knights of the Holy Order, an ecumenical... God, that's a big word. (laughs) ...religious group (laughs) operating out of the Vatican that works to defeat evil. He is sent to Transylvania to fight Count Dracula. Van Helsing, he then comes face to face with vampires, werewolves, and Frankenstein's monster. And it's proto-dark universe. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so when... uh, This is one of those movies I don't remember seeing. Uh, Like, I just always... I don't remember being blown away by it. I don't remember being... Uh, I like hating it. It's just a movie that uh, it seems like has always been around. And I, I mean, I like it. It's a, it's a really, it's one of those like fun kind of comforting movies. That's just, I mean, it's not a good movie. I would not say that this is a great example of it's cinema. It's so cheesy. It is, I, I mean, love yeah, it. it's cheesy and, and it's kind of um, corny, but, but it's really fun. It, it it's, does. It's entertaining. It's entertaining. It does what it does really well. And I, I like uh, I, watching it again uh, this last week. I, I, I rem- it was like rediscovering uh, uh, something in the back of your closet, like an old shirt. Like, oh, I, I remember this. Why, why has it been so long? Oh, yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, I remember seeing it in high school, like right as I was starting high school, at the movie theater with a couple of my buddies because we were all like, you know, loved the old movie monsters. But we had a really limited experience with the old movie monsters. We've seen Dracula once. And we knew about Frankenstein and we knew about the wolf man. <laughs> yeah. We're like, oh man, these are cool, you know, but we never really got to take a look at it. And uh, that was our kind of our first introduction to those universal movie monsters. And by universal, do you mean the studio, Universal Studios? Universal right. Studios, okay. yeah. Uh, the first time that I remember watching it, I think I was like 16 and it came on television and I was just totally enamored. Um, I've always been really interested in the whole vampire, werewolf, Frankenstein's monster, like, genre, I guess you can say. And so, watching, I was like, this has everything. How have I never seen this before? And so, when I found out that we were going to be doing this as an episode for the podcast, I went and bought the movie, and I've watched it about five times since then. Oh, wow. (laughs) It's so cheesy that I love it. And Hugh Jackman, what class? Well, yeah, it's true. I mean, Hugh Jackman, it's it's hard to go wrong. yeah. <laughs> you know, so I think we can all kind of agree that we really enjoyed this movie. Yeah. But it's not a great movie. I, it, yeah, it's not going to be studied in film school. It's not going to change. <laughs> well, I, you know, I say that, but now I might I might have to walk that back a little bit. Because it, it's not, I, although it, it, in itself I don't think it's that good. But I do think it is important in kind of the overall uh, history of movies, because this was the one of the first examples in the modern era of uh, something that we kind of take for granted now. Like you were just saying, Garrett, the whole mashing up of different things together. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, is, this is that just in one movie. Now, 
you know, the Marvel movies, they have a gajillion different mm-hmm. separate movies, and then they bring them together in the Avengers. And the, the whole idea of a cinematic universe, we just, we, we don't think that that's all that unusual now. Uh, because Marvel's doing it, DC's trying to do it, uh, they're doing it with King Kong and Godzilla, and... Right. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, they they did Godzilla a few years ago, King Kong this summer, and where have I been? Yeah, but uh, Universal is doing the same thing now. They're calling it the Dark Universe. Well, I think they they were the pioneers of it originally because if you look back and you know the forties and fifties, you have Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. Right. We have you know Dracula meets Swamp Thing, and I don't know. I'm just making stuff up by now, but <laughs> oh, they, that would be fun. <laughs> those did exist. <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, so I think they were kind of like the pioneer of that mashup. And now we're just kind of seeing a resurgence of it. Right. This in the, in, in today's, you know, modern era, this was the the first example, but well, I think I, I can't think of a, an earlier one, but it, it kind of makes sense. Cause like you said, universal, um, that's what they they've done for a long time. And they were thinking about rebooting this again just a few years ago. And that the popularity of the Avengers and, and all of the other kinds of stories like this led them to basically develop, instead, instead of redoing Van Helsing as a single movie, trying to separate it out into a bunch of different movies. So Tom Cruise's The Mummy came out. Not to very impressive reviews, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see how that, uh, how that progresses. Because they're planning on doing an Invisible Man movie. Uh, oh, really? A, a Bride of Frankenstein yep. movie. A Creature of the Black Lagoon movie. Oh, I'm stoked for that one. Um, I'm, I'm, ex- I'm just stoked for all of it. It's going to yeah. be awesome. It, 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 it's a really, really cool idea to take these old... Because, I mean, the monsters that are in this movie are so much older than even Universal Pictures. Yeah. Uh, but to, to let them really play, oh, man, the, the, the things that they can do now with, with special effects and things, it, it could be really cool. I mean, I mean, the special effects in this one weren't terrible, especially for the time. Yeah, for 2004. But looking back now, it's just kind of like, oh, oh. Yeah, oh. You, you can tell, mm-hmm. but... Well, I don't know that that werewolf transformation. That was, was cool. I was ripping the skin off. That's Ooh. clever. I just think it's kind of gross. Well, yeah, <laughs> it was kind of gross, but still, <laughs> it looked cool mm-hmm. and and kind of different. I mean, so often when they transform into a werewolf, it's more. I don't know. It, 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 I don't know how to really put it into words. My mind automatically goes to an American werewolf in London. Oh yeah, okay. Where it's like almost claymation. <laughs> oh yeah. It, it's not. It's not that terrible, but I mean, it, it was cool. I, I remember seeing that and getting freaked out. But mm-hmm. uh, it's you could still kind of tell that there was some issues. <laughs> okay, so we do have a bunch of different monsters that we can talk about, uh, yes. and each each one has its own history its own uh, its own backstory of the different creatures in this movie which one would you say is the scariest since we were just talking about being scared uh, I mean, I, with the admission that, I mean, none of them are really all that frightening in themselves. This is not a horror movie. This is an action no. film. But of uh, you've got vampires, werewolves, Frankenstein's monster. You've got those creepy little dwarf things. Oh, yeah. The servants. Uh, Dracula's henchmen. Oh. The dwergy. He, he calls them dwergy. I think they're supposed to be like dwarves. Yeah. yeah. Their faces are terrifying. They have some really bad teeth. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of of those, like when you were a kid, especially, which one of those would freak you out the most? I, I think the werewolf would freak me out, but I always thought they were super cool. <laughs> so as much as I think that like they're terrifying, I really think that they're awesome and would be like, if I had to choose a monster that I had to be, <laughs> it'd probably be werewolf. Oh, okay. but it's terrifying too. See, for me, it was always the vampires, and it was because like. You know, you look at some stories and the vampires are like the cool hip ones. And then you look at things like Van Helsing where they turn blue and their mouths get really big and they look like they're about to, you know, eat your face off. But that was what, the one from this movie, that's what scares me the most would be the vampires. The vampires. Yeah. Because it's just kind of like, <clears throat> they turn all creepy. Yeah, I think in, the, in this one, the vampires would be the scariest oh, to especially me. the brides like oh, that pale oh, blue like yeah hello oh. anna <laughs> <laughs> was like, ah. yeah that uh i think well yeah i think vampires in general well that's when you just more. moved to somewhere sunny <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that's true although i still really want to visit transylvania 
I mean, I feel like it might be a little bit pretty. <laughs> go over to Romania. So, uh, as far as uh, as vampires go, no, back that up. You need a better transition than that. <laughs> Speaking of vampires. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you said that vampires freaked you out in this movie. So let, let's talk about what makes them so terrifying. Uh, not only, like, in this movie, but this movie draws from so many different types of folklore about vampires. Like, we, let's just discuss what is so crazy about the vampires. Well, it doesn't, like you just said, doesn't every group in... Oop, there goes my ring. Every group in history have some sort of, like, blood-sucking demon... A lot of story. Them. A I don't lot. know if every one. Well, a lot. Uh, yeah. I mean, across continents, across cultures, across time, I mean, there's either a demon or a monster or some kind of creature, yeah, that sucks blood, eats children. Yep. The one that I've heard of uh, the most before when I've done, like, little research by myself uh, was primarily uh, Lilith. The oh, yeah. Jewish demon okay. that would come back and like eat babies. <laughs> That's the one that always comes to my mind whenever I think like ancient vampires. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, there's a few things in this movie that draw from Jewish demonology or Jewish lore. But Lilith was Yeah, well, there's a few stories about her. A lot the one of the common trends with Lilith is that she was Eve's predecessor. That she was maybe the mother of demons but uh, hmm. that she was created initially to be the mate for Adam. You know, she was a human, but that she didn't want to serve Adam like, like women are supposed to serve men. So goes the story. And so her punishment was that she was cast out of Eden on her own, where she became like this, this demon to terrorize humanity. Oh dear. Hmm. That's a lot more terrifying than I remember. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, Lilith, you see uh, Lilith connected with demons in a few different ways, or different kinds of cursed spirits. All right. Yeah, that's a, that's a Debbie Downer, if you've already heard one. <laughs> well, so yeah. what are some of the other ones uh, that other folklores? Because I'm only really, like, familiar with Lilith. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, uh, it's funny that our idea of, of vampires, is it's kind of, well, it's very story cauldron-esque. It mixes up a, a bunch of different uh, things about... Uh, demons or or different things from from different cultures. Oh, uh, sure. Like the like Lilith, you're not gonna see her hanging upside down or something. But the the idea of a, of a vampire bat and uh, hanging upside down, or or the Indian, vet, I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce this, but a vetela, vetela. Yeah, vetela. I came across that and I was like, I'm gonna let Anthony say that. Word. <laughs> yeah, you guys can tell us how to pronounce this, but uh, that's a, it's a spirit that uh, reanimates corpses, so it's kind of like um, bringing bringing dead things back to life and it's no, it's known for um yeah apparently hanging upside down oh <laughs> yeah uh but you'll you'll see things in um in africa uh you'll see things a, a lot of them have to do with burial practices a, a lot mm. of the the stories ha- um say if you don't bury someone properly then they might rise back up out of the grave and and whatever that means different cultures have lots of different ideas about the, what the right way to bury someone is if you bury them with something if there's certain things you have to say if there's certain times to do it at but if you do it wrong then it might not stick you don't messed up <laughs> and and <laughs> if they come back then uh they're usually not going to be happy uh, so well, why would you be if you were improperly buried <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah so our our idea of the vampire is going to be kind of mixing this this idea of coming back from the dead with demons that might try to be sucking your life essence or your blood. Mm-hmm. And, and then um, Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula. Uh, well, that's exactly what he did. What you, he drank blood? Well, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he drew from all these different oh, right, right. <laughs> things to create Dracula. And maybe he did drink blood. I don't know. Hey, I don't know what, he, what people do in their <laughs> personal time. What he did in his free time is all him. <laughs> you do you, boo-boo. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and for the longest time, though, vampires... Like, now, the weird thing, I think, is that we think of vampires as being attractive and sexy. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Stephanie Mayer. Well, it's... I mean, well... 
she takes it in and uh, she turns it into the high school version. Of yeah, that. she sure. turns it Shouldn't into the sparkly blame, version. Should we blame Anne Rice then? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, honestly, she has a lot to do with it. Uh, Anne Rice. I mean, there there were some. Uh, <laughs> there was a soap opera, uh, almost basically like a soap opera called Dark Shadows in the sixties. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Wait, have you seen Dark Shadows? Yes. Uh-huh. Well, they made a remake. They of did it a, a remake of, oh, with Johnny okay. Depp as well. But yeah. I've okay. seen gotcha. uh, some of the original episodes. Yeah, yeah. So, and our and, mom is a huge fan of classic TV. So, <laughs> dark, dark Shadows equals <laughs> classic TV for well, her. Well, I mean, Hashtag it also helps that they, dark uh, shadows. they uh, made references to it in Gilmore Girls a lot. <clears throat> ah, <laughs> I might have known. <laughs> so, so yeah, Dark Shadows set the stage for Anne Rice to write Interview with a Vampire and the whole saga of Lestat. Um, in the 70s, and th- that turned the, the pop- popular cultural idea in, in the West uh, about vampires on its head. Yeah, I mean, because if you look at the n- original movie, Nosferatu, which was the original adaptation of Dracula, he is not an attractive dude. He, he has like, some funky teeth. <laughs> dude looks like Voldemort. Uh, oh, he, yeah. Seriously, right? Does. I mean, bald and nasty. Not Tom Riddle, Voldemort. Right, yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Ugly, noseless man. Yes. But once you tell this story of this romantic, eternal lover uh, called Lestat, and especially once uh, you have a movie with Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt in the 90s, I mean... What character is Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt in the 90s not going to make sexy? <laughs> uh, and, uh. <laughs> well, that just Boom. flipped us all over. Mic drop. Right? But those were based, those more modern vampires, were they more based off of uh, more Western European folklore? Oh, rather than like the, uh, uh, the Vitella, <laughs> are you saying? Yeah, yeah, more than like uh, Jewish demonology or oh, Indian yeah. folklore. Yeah, there's, uh, so out of Romania, like if there's one thing that we really are going to th- recognize as vam- vampiric, it's this monster called a st- the Strigoi or Strigoi? No, Strigoi. I think Strigoi. it's a hard G. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, from Romania. And that, that is this undead spirit that's able to drain your energy through blood. It can turn into animals. Like we, we think of vampires turning into uh, bats or dogs. I think mm-hmm. in Bram Stoker's Dracula, mm-hmm. he turns into several different creatures. Children of the night. What <laughs> music they make. Yeah, even what the accent, a right? Miss they make. <laughs> Transylvania, some, somewhere there in Eastern Europe. That, yeah. That's going to really be um, influential for us. And I know a lot of people talk about Vlad the Impaler mm-hmm. having some influence on. Vlad Dracula. Bram Stoker. Yeah, that was, uh, well, it was the story of just this horrible, horrible guy. And he, that was the identity that he gave his vampire. Yeah, there's not really much concrete evidence that Stoker actually knew a lot about the historical Vlad Dracula. Uh, like the, the, the guy who was known as the, uh, the, the dragon, the dragon, the Vlad the <laughs> Impaler. I mean, brutal guy. And maybe Stoker had heard some things uh, about him, but it, there's it's hard to draw a lot of clear connections. Yeah, uh, for sure, uh, uh, at least. <clears throat> but hey, it, like it, it's one of those things that maybe maybe it's just out there in the the kind of uh, public consciousness again, right? Mm-hmm. Who knows exactly where Stoker's getting all of his ideas from. Well, I know Bram Stoker built a story from a bunch of different areas. And, uh, in fact, if you listen to Lore uh, from Aaron Mankey, great podcast, by the oh, way. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, his first episode was about one of the inspirations for Dracula. And it was about uh, people dying of consumption and them thinking that, holy crap, they are <laughs> Dra- or they're not Dracula. They're, they're vampires. vampires. Like that was one of the stories that he picked up while he was in the U.S. And he went back, and oh, that was gotcha. part of the inspiration. And so, I mean, he drew inspiration from everywhere. And in fact, there is even some inspiration from some of the old traditions, the like the dead ringers. You've heard about that? Oh, sitting in the graveyard, sitting in a graveyard, yeah. uh, ringing the bell, 
And uh, okay, okay now that's the most terrifying thing to me. Never mind vampires Th- being buried right alive. Oh god. Oh yes. yes. So anyway, there's that. People would think, oh crap, they're not dead yet. <laughs> um, they're supposed to be dead. Or um, yeah, I mean, how terrifying to exhume a body for whatever reason and then find claw marks on the on the exactly lid it's of the casket. Terrifying. <laughs> then you start booby trapping the caskets and just to make sure that whatever's down there doesn't come back. And, you know, poor guy that accidentally got buried. But, oh, you know, like, that's cry. that's a fear, like, just seeing somebody dig themselves out of the ground. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I kind of digressed on that one. <laughs> Where did this rabbit trail come from? I feel like I forgot. Bram Stoker. Yes. I've heard of him. Yes. The, the author of the original Dracula book. Good book. What is it, 1897? Who knows? I didn't Something like it in middle school. That's Something. As far yeah, as late 1800s. Somewhere around there. And, uh, you know, he crafted his story from all these different uh, folklore and areas and bits of news. And, I mean, he came up with a great story. Yeah, it's... Uh, I, I read the book in high school, and I didn't know that it was um, an epistolary novel right where it's all written like a bunch of letters and journal entries yeah. and things like yeah. I've never seen I didn't a book know like that, that when I started reading it either and I was so it, I thought it was the coolest thing I'd never even heard of a book <laughs> like that before and it was it was really fun you feel like almost more of a detective while you're reading because you're you're having to like put these these pieces together yourself it's really, it just kind of made me of feel like i was reading through someone else's mail and i was like this is illegal <laughs> maybe that's why i was maybe i just like being nosy I mean, to each their own. And still, there's, I mean, there's bits of that book, the, the, the character of, I wish that there had been a character like this in Van Helsing, but um, the, 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 the inmate who is eating the flies. Renfield. Oh. Renfield, that's yeah. his name. Yeah, like he's, he, well, he feeds the flies to the spiders and he feeds the spiders to the something uh-huh. bigger. So he can then, get more lives. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Right. The first, Creepy idea. I love the it. The first introduction I had to anything dealing with vampires was Mel Brooks' film Dracula, Dead and Loving oh. It. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, I love Leslie that Nielsen. movie. <laughs> so that's, my first thought is always goes to that story because, you know, it actually did a really good job mm-hmm. of following. <laughs> Especially the, the very end. Spoilers, sorry. <laughs> Renfield, you're your own man now. Your master's dead. Oh. Oh, yes. Now come, Renfield. Yes, yes master. master. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they played it up so well. Um, and this is the same vampire as in Dracula that's depicted in all the movies. It's depicted in the book. Is the same one it's depicted in Van Helsing. Mm-hmm. And uh, in they fact, they classed a... him up and gave him a cool jacket. Oh, he was yeah. really classy in this one. Very suave. He, he was mm. totally Especially different. For 1888, like, yeah, I was going to say totally second. different than Nosferatu and Leslie Nielsen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but so we've we've talked about him. Like one of the things that popped up in this movie was that Dracula couldn't be killed like a normal vampire. I mean, you see them shooting these like holy water soaked bolts from a crossbow and... which side note real fast why hasn't that been thought of in more movies honestly oh, that was dipping really cool. the arrow in holy water of like of course you would do that that makes so much sense thanks yeah. carl right yeah. well carl. that maybe that's it more movies need a carl yeah i agree carl. as much as everyone wants to be van helsing we're all carl <laughs> i'm okay with that Carl the Friar. I'm only a friar. I just want, <laughs> I just want Hugh Jackman's hair from this movie. Huh. Has, Fair enough. He has good hair. <laughs> well, but yeah, you, you can you can kill the brides. You can kill the brides enough. with all these different things. And uh, in fact, some of these are in traditional folklore, like the wooden stake through the heart. Uh, yeah, and well, that's the that's the main one that really pops up into mind. But there's also you know the silver stakes. The rings of garlic. Um, Did they actually use the garlic? I remember he was putting it in his sack at the beginning. Yeah, I don't think they used it. I don't remember. But, yeah. uh, But the the crazy thing about uh, this movie was that nothing could kill Dracula except for one thing in particular. And it was the bite of a werewolf. Hell yeah. Sure, why not? So that, uh, okay, let's let's go with that. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I think I think that might have just been a function of this story. Yeah, right? like you need something that to particular tie plot device. Right, you need something to tie the werewolves and the vampires together. I mean, now those are not disconnected ideas in folklore, but in this story, you, yeah, they're. It's it's a nice plot device to set up that final battle, isn't it? Yeah. Well, for sure. And I really like the whole, um, but he's been using werewolves to do his bidding for years. Well, yeah, none of them have had the, none of them have had the guts to go and fight him. So. Yeah. Just kind of like, huh. Yeah, that was a little unclear to me. He was able to hypnotize the werewolf. Uh, Is that it? I don't know. I mean, they, they said something like if he didn't hurry, like after three, though I'm talking about the brother. When the brother becomes a werewolf. Falcon. Yeah, he has a couple of days or something. Before he has until uh, midnight, midnight of his first full moon. Yeah. Okay, and then after that, Dracula can control him. I, I don't know because it seemed like he after was... that he's a werewolf and he can't like think for himself as Valken anymore. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the curse completely takes hold. I don't know. That was a little unclear to me. Yeah, I've watched this well, movie too many times. Should we just? <laughs> Jump on over to werewolves now. Yeah, I mean, let's sure. do it because oh, I, right. I think the way that um, that they portray werewolves in this is, I, I think they do a better job of portraying werewolves than they portray vampires. Like the vampires are fun, but the vampires are just kind of like really. Uh, Dracula is hardly even in his vampiric form until that yeah. big final battle. Yeah, the yeah. brides though they're they're terrifying. She's yeah, they're they're scary, scarier. But I'm just so happy though when know. they die. <laughs> Yeah, it is pretty satisfying. My favorite is when the last one dies, just because of what Anna says with the whole, like, I think if you're going to kill someone, you should do it instead of standing there talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> As, and I know it's it's a movie, and so you know that she's going to catch that vial when Carl throws it, but still, like, my heart leaps up into my chest. Because like, it's just so far. I don't know. Huh, but <laughs> I mean, they're, they're my just entire thought good. during this movie parkour to you sir because it was a lot well but, and not to mention the fact that she's doing all of that in the most impractical corset you'll ever see <laughs> yeah not basically. that there are practical yeah. corsets i suppose <laughs> <Pretty much. laughs> but, but anyway, honestly i mean she's like flipping and ah, well never mind we, yeah. were, we were gonna yeah. start talking about werewolves let's get back on right the, werewolves let's get back werewolves? on the train what corsets right. werewolves, werewolves. basically werewolves. The same. No. um well, that, that, okay, so werewolves, we've talked about vampires being all over every culture. Werewolves are about the same. I mean, you always have these, what, transfigurations of uh, people into animals, and wolves seem to be probably, like, the biggest in all the folklore yeah, and all the stories and histories that we've found. Especially in Europe, yeah. Oh, especially yeah. in Europe. Mm-hmm. But you also have stories of uh, manitous and wolfmen here in the and Native American lore. And you have, I think what we normally think of as a werewolf would be the European werewolf, which is, you know, based out of uh, Scandinavia mostly, but then it has (coughs) different areas uh, all over Europe that you hear of a man turning into a wolf. In fact, one of my favorites and one of the oldest probably would be, uh, from the Volsung, uh, oh yeah, Volsung stories, and definitely uh, one of the oldest. Yeah, you're giving me a weird look, Garrett. <laughs> no, I'm just I don't know what you're talking about, so, I'm waiting <laughs> to so you can teach me. <laughs> um, so in the Volsung series, it's it's more or less a cloak that you put on that you and you become a wolf for what was it seven days? Uh, oh, I don't remember. Yeah, it's, I, it's it was, not. It was permanent. a period of time, but it wasn't permanent. Uh, it's and like a tool. It's not necessarily it's a, a tool. curse. Yeah. Uh, look at it. You get the powers of a wolf. You become a wolf pretty much. And uh, one of the side effects is that you develop a taste for human flesh. Oh. Yeah. Which is kind of... That's nifty. Crappy for the rest of us. <laughs> but yeah, you can take it off. Like you take the skin off like a coat. And uh, then you're a man again. <laughs> and which Van Helsing's depiction of the werewolf actually like ripping his skin off to transform it fits pretty yeah. well with that. And then ripping off the fur to become right. a man again. So. And he, did he have clothes underneath? He had, oh, he, he did. He had the ripped off Hulk pants. Yeah, he had the Hulk pants. Yeah. And every single time that he switched back and forth, it was kind of like there were less and less clothes. <laughs> yeah. Because he's becoming more and more animalistic. Ooh, symbolism. Maybe. Maybe. 
I mean, I just thought it was, you know, because <laughs> he turns into a werewolf and his clothes yeah. get torn to shreds. Yeah. Every time. Yeah, yeah I... I Does, so. Definitely doesn't look like the Lon Chaney werewolf <laughs> <laughs> wearing a suit. <laughs> <laughs> so in the... I, I don't... I don't remember the Volsung saga well enough. Uh, is is it considered a curse? The the like being a werewolf, uh, or is it more? I don't know. It was it was like, more just hey, this happened, and you just have to be aware that you're going to develop this taste and just yeah. kind of compensate for that. Well, um, what I remember is that how similar it was to other uh, areas, and I'm I'm wondering because Ireland has their own werewolf stories. Mm. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, if that has any connection to the the Viking tales or anything like that. Because I mean, the Vikings took over as much land as they could. They invaded Ireland, mm. and a lot of uh, anyway bringing their stories about werewolves to exactly. The Irish uh, I mean, it's it's one of those cultural indoctrination type things. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, we're gonna make you guys marry our wives, and <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna adopt some of our culture, and, but. There's a, a story in Ireland, the werewolves of Ossery, or the, the wolves of Ossery, and it's about a man and a woman. Well, actually, it starts out with two wolves. A wolf, male wolf, comes up to a guy and uh, who's actually like a priest, I think, and is talking to this guy, you know, a wolf talking to a guy and said, hey. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, my partner, my wife, is not well. Uh, please come follow me. And he's like, no, you could trust me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. You know, of course no, I can. Yeah, why not? They end up going to this cave where he sees this wolf, which is mortally wounded or like terminally ill, something like that. And the priest delivers last rites to this wolf and the wolf turns into a woman under a wolf skin coat, uh, oh. as she dies. And that was the, uh, yeah. And that was one of the like early Christian stories. In Ireland. Um, in Ireland. And uh, there's also another story about the, uh, I mean, well, there's tons of them in Ireland, actually, because you have the the dogmen of Tipperary. Okay, who... that's the one I thought you were going to talk about. <laughs> now I'm just very confused. <laughs> yeah, there's the dogmen of Tipperary who were these warriors that would turn into wolves and, you know, go into that that rage, that bloodlust. And, uh, that sounds uh, Viking. That, yeah. Yeah. And it's what's crazy is Tipperary's in Western Ireland, the opposite side where the Vikings hmm. came in. So, um, but the Celts in general were like <laughs> nuts. Anyway, the uh, the dogmen of Tipperary would fight battles for these kings. They were kind of like mercenaries for hire, but they wouldn't take payment and gold or anything. They would only take payment in the flesh of newborn babies, which is huh. well, that's that's nice. Gross. But they were the most ferocious, like warriors, and they would always win. So some kings would pay the price, and it's you know disturbing. But so, th- and that's one of the the old uh, pre-Christian Ireland like stories. Uh, but then there's another one that I'm I can think of where uh, a man who turned into a werewolf ended up protecting a parish in Northern Ireland, I do believe. And he was basically like a guard dog, for lack of a better term, for a parish. So they can be uh, not just these like evil, crazy, not just deranged these evil monsters. Poor Nana. <laughs> Flesh hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Pan would be a totally different story if Nana was a werewolf. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> they don't have to be this crazy, deranged animal that feasts on people. Um, And I think that that last story where he protects the parish kind of goes really well with this Van Helsing, considering that they were used as a tool for the church. Oh, you mean how Van Helsing becomes one to save the day? Kind of. Totally by accident, but they still use Van Helsing as a, well, as they say in the movie, a murderer. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a tool for the church. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, like uh, making things that are, you know, evil, a little more tolerable for the, the means to an end to save the church. I feel like there's a lot of stories that kind of go that direction, especially from like the Middle Ages, how the church 
taking over, taming these wild animals and mm-hmm. making them use for good, you know? Yeah, it's funny that we tend to think of werewolves now not so much as a uh, tool or, or something used at all, but, but a curse that mm-hmm. makes people go crazy, right? That, that you think of, um, uh, whether it's, you said American werewolf in London or, um, uh, with twilight, maybe being an exception, it's, <laughs> it should, the be, hunky werewolf. should always be an exception, but <laughs> I mean, the, uh, you know, TV shows, supernatural Buffy, the vampire slayer, where it shows up, it's you, you are infected. I mean, they talk about it like a disease, you know, you, you're not wearing a belt or a cloak or something. You're bitten, and then you or Harry, Harry Potter too. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's a it's a curse, it, and yeah. it's something that makes you lose control of yourself. Absolutely, and, and Van Helsing um, does definitely incorporate that. There's a nice little bit of convenient delay of losing yourself completely, so that he can, yeah, <laughs> so know. he can be cured, right. Which is oh, that's such a such a wonderful thing that he just uh, that Dracula just happens to have the cure. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? That maybe maybe, but the um, uh, that that idea of, of it being a a curse is something that you see maybe in more southern areas of Europe. I don't know if there's a geographical explanation for this, um, but. Even in Greek mythology, you'll have story the story of um, Lycaon, who was cursed by Zeus mm-hmm. to turn into a wolf because uh, he. It's hard to keep all the people that Zeus didn't like straight, but Lycaon <laughs> did them. something that Zeus didn't like, and so <laughs> Zeus curses him and his family to become wolves. But even then, you know, as I'm saying that, there are stories from from down south about wolves being good too, uh, with like Romulus and Remus being yeah. suckled by a by a, a mother wolf, and to then go on and, and found Rome in the Roman Empire. So, mm-hmm. uh, well, there's uh, you know, we, we talk about <coughs> dogs. So you know we'll, we'll talk about dogs being uh, man's best friend, and uh, we do have this very old relationship with them, kind of a yeah. maybe love hate relationship. If you go back far enough, I love werewolves, but there's two things that I want to get to before we. Uh, come up to the end of the hour. And one is Frankenstein. Yeah, and absolutely. two is Gabriel. Oh, yeah, that's right. So let's talk about Frankenstein for a bit. Okay. Thoughts? Uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. It's a lie! Mm-hmm. Or the modern Prometheus. Mm. The, yeah, if you want the full title. <laughs> <laughs> if you're only pr- you're you proud could of see our one. faces. Oh, <laughs> I am impressed. Garrett's patting Thanks. himself on the back. Wikipedia is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> have you had to read Frankenstein? I have not, actually. Oh, man. I mean, I read Dracula just because I really wanted to in middle school, yep. but Frankenstein, it just never came up. It was well, never on any reading lists or anything. I have a copy, and I Me? also have seven different adaptations on film. <laughs> So seven? <laughs> I have seven. Oh my god! Some including of them are better than young others, Frankenstein. including Young Frankenstein, mm-hmm. and I'm pretty sure one of them is like Frankenstein meets the Wolfman or something like that too. Can't remember the exact title, <laughs> but yeah. it's there. Scooby Doo's not in that one, is he? Oh, you know what? Now eight or nine now. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, let's talk about it, especially since. Bram Stoker and Mary Shelley were kind of contemporaries. And, I wonder, did uh, do we know if they knew each other? Did they ever go I in the hope same circles? So. That would be like a, a, a hmm. literary Avengers. I was about Ooh. to say, yeah. <laughs> no, nah, that's League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Oh, good point. Uh, good point. Oh, man. I wanted so badly to like that movie. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like it for bad. No, we're not going to get off on that track. <laughs> Okay, so uh, Frankenstein's monster is, you know, it's this story about the the mad Dr. Frankenstein who wants to capture the essence of life. He wants to create, he wants to bring something to life. You know, there's that that, uh, classic scene with the lightning flashing all over the place. And yeah, exactly, (laughs) exactly. Uh, so it's kind of a, uh, a zombie movie cause he's, or a zombie story cause he's, he's stitching all of these different dead people together, you know, the same way you would build a car out of spare parts and then hitting it with lightning and, and it manages to work. I mean, you know, he creates life, but the thing that he creates, um, 
because uh, because Frankenstein generally got his material, for lack of a better word, his parts out of this graveyard um, filled with criminals, the uh, the monster is. Uh, what what do you say? Infected with that? I mean, he he carries that evil from those criminals still, and so he goes out and starts uh, well killing things. The creature. He just wants to be happy, and he'll kill to get there. The brain was Abby normal. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to be very sorry. honest though. With this film, Van Helsing, mm-hmm. I am so sad that Doctor Frankenstein wasn't in it more because he's one of my favorite characters, and I think he was just. I liked his little bit at the beginning, and I'm so sad that he got killed off so fast. But I can understand how it has to happen for the film. And the well, one of the things that caught me off guard that was kind of a flip flop from the the original Frankenstein to Van Helsing was uh, they make it a point to say this creature is not evil. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, in Van Helsing? Yeah. In Van Helsing, they, they make it a point. They said, I cannot kill him. You cannot kill him because I can only kill things that are evil. This may have mm-hmm. been created by evil, but it is not, by in essence, evil. Mm-hmm. But the Vatican still wanted to k- kill him because he wasn't human. Because, yeah, he's not natural. Yeah. They say. And that actually fits more with Shelley's original story. Like, the movie... The movie Frankenstein, you know, he's this evil criminal. But in Shelley's story, he's a lot sweeter. I mean, he mm-hmm. he actually is more... He wants to be good. He just kind of is a victim of circumstances. Yeah, and, and there's this whole uh, bit in, in Shelley's story where he, like, befriends this family. And there's actually this really sad scene where the, the creature um, looks at it, you know, he catches his reflection in a mm. pool of water and is terrified by what his own face looks like. You know, that's, you know, that's pretty it's pretty sad. sad. So um, I agree. I think the uh, the Frankenstein's monster, or the you know, whatever we want to call him, uh, is one of the sweetest characters in Van Helsing. You, mm-hmm. know, you can't not like that that's guy. True. I mean, he's all about self sacrifice mm-hmm. at some points just to save uh, a few others. I mean, <laughs> not even like an entire village. It's just a few others at the moment, and uh, um. Yeah, and that's why he went into hiding, and he just wants to be good. Mm-hmm. Lived off, lived off absinthe at the bottom of a burnt down windmill for a year. <laughs> there was so much absinthe. In yeah, that that's window. true. How was he? Was he like eating rats or something? Well, there was, there was a pile of, of something by yeah. the by the water. Huh. It's carnivorous. Yeah. Well, I think we should take a look at look back at what the inspiration for Frankenstein's monster uh, really was. Because if you look at it, Mary Shelley was in, well, this is how the story goes, at least. Mary Shelley was in a a story writing contest with her husband, Percy Shelley, and Lord Byron. And they, uh, it was like a, let's preface this with, it was a dark and stormy night. (laughs) And they had been taking opiates and drinking a lot of alcohol. And like you do. (laughs) Talking about German folklore and new scientific uh, advancements and well, just all around ghost stories. And she mentions that hey, I feel like we should have a story writing contest. And all of these things that they were talking about m- ended up in her story because some people would say that uh, Frankenstein, the doctor, was an inspiration of a man in Germany, southern Germany or something, where she had just vacationed, hmm. uh, who would steal, or well, go grave robbing and steal body parts and just everybody thought he was insane. And then the talk of, oh, what is it called? Galvanization, um, basically bringing things to life with the power of a battery. Oh. All of these things came together and wound up in her story and wasn't considered a horror book at first. It was more along the lines of science fiction, which, I mean, it still is, yeah. but yeah, we look at it a little technology. differently because the technology is way behind us <laughs> and where we are right now. But um, for the time, yeah, that was pretty extreme. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I hadn't, I guess I hadn't really thought about it until you just said it that way, but it is basically more of a science fiction story than it is a horror story. It's, I mean, one, the 
Lon Chaney era turned it into a yeah, kind of horror yeah. story because that's what they were making. They were making monster movies. It but, looks like Boris Karloff. Yeah, 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 right? So, I mean, all these things came together to kind of show... Uh, I mean, it was very story cauldron esque. She took everything that was kind of relevant at that point and just made it into one little story that I, appealed to a large audience. And you know what? Girl won the competition. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I can't remember the other stories that came out of it. <laughs> So I'm pretty exactly. sure she won. <laughs> oh, well, there was uh, this. This is a, uh, more of a footnote, but um, w- John Polidari was one of the other people involved in that story writing oh, contest. Wasn't nice. He? I, I, I don't remember. It was just Lord Byron and Percy and Mary Shelley. I thought Polidari was there, too. Um, if if I'm right about that, I think that he wrote the book called The Vampire as a result of that. Oh, OK, which wa- it, it was well known. But once Bram Stoker wrote. And Dracula. Bram Stoker wrote his a couple years after that. Yeah, I, I think right. um, it definitely, of the two, Stoker's Dracula definitely stuck more. Yeah, but yeah. Um, Polidari's story, and I'm probably butchering that name too, but the vampire. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure, I would I would bet at least $10 that, <laughs> that I'm right about that. Yeah, I, I just know it from oh, countless, I don't know, hours just reading over different authors and their works and yeah. stuff like that. Uh, and, and Shelley's, I mean, she was pretty clear what she was doing. It's all right there in the subtitle. I mean, when, when she subtitled Frankenstein as the modern Prometheus, I mean that she's referencing the, the ancient Greek myth of, mm-hmm. of Prometheus, this, this character who in, in Greek, a lot of Greek stories is the, the God who is directly responsible for the creation of humanity in the first place. Yeah. He molded us out of clay. Uh, so that, so. In, uh, Dr. Frankenstein is the is the modern creator mm-hmm. of life out of uh, their body parts, I guess. <laughs> it's a little more gruesome. Just a bit. And, and it's also worth noting that Prometheus in Greek myth ends up um, being punished for his... Uh, for some of his actions. You know, he, he gets chained to the rock and... Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Has the bird have to eat his liver? Every his day liver. That's what it is. Grows, yeah. And then it bird comes the next day, eats his liver. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that uh, that that kind of punishment for loving his his creation because he he was he stole things to give to humanity and that's why he's chained up on the rock like um, fire. And yeah, Doctor Frankenstein is similarly punished for loving his creation uh, too much. Mm-hmm. And uh, and what do you know? Fire ends up getting involved in that uh, that downfall, also, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So along with uh, Mary Shelley and Percy Shelley and Lord Byron and uh, who was the guy that did the? I am pretty sure it's John Polidari. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I uh, just wanted to make sure that I didn't say it, that you did. <laughs> Touche. And uh, um, let's talk about one more character that's in the movie. Very briefly, but still an important oh, yeah. character of that uh, era. I, I almost um, forgot that he's in this movie, actually. <laughs> and uh, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, because well, he's he's mostly Mister Hyde, but does yeah. become Doctor Jekyll. Poor guy. When he falls to his death. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you have listened to our Moana podcast, we talked about them for a little while. Mm-hmm. But that, that that's a, a really uh, nice short little story from Robert Louis Stevenson uh, all about uh, an, another mad scientist who is mm, who, who, who meets a, a, a pretty disturbing end because of his experiments. Yeah. Yeah. But he's experimenting on himself rather than on dead already dead bodies. And he's pretty much distilling the evil in his own. Well, well. I don't know what I would call it. Like uh, soul. Body, soul, yeah. nature. <laughs> and in, uh, uh, although in the original book, he, he does kind of physically change, but not, not really in. <laughs> he changes it, somewhat in appearance. And yeah, his, he looks different. His face like twists and stuff, but he doesn't become 10 feet tall. <laughs> no, and he doesn't like swing from rafters and, mm-hmm. you know, he, I'm sure bullets would still affect him. Yeah. <laughs> um, I I really like how they do Jekyll and Hyde in this. I, or Hyde. I mean, he's really uh, entertaining. Yeah. 
I mean, and it is a good introduction to Van Helsing's character too. That he ah, that to, that is true. Yeah, to be all cool and fight him. What freaked me out a little bit was when he cuts his arm off, dude, and it it shrinks, but no blood. Yeah, it's that like was instantly weird. cauterized or something, and he's just like, hanging out. You know, I hadn't thought arm of that. Flopping on the ground. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. It's uh, it's it immediately just becomes like a mannequin arm. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, I'm kind of glad that it didn't just hop up on its fingers and turn into thing from the Adams family, but because uh, that would fuel my nightmares. You know, what would have really been funny is if uh, that arm ended up getting used in the Frankenstein monster. Oh, what genius! Bringing it all around <laughs> and full circle. We're done here. Yeah. Okay. Time to go. Uh, home. We can we can go home. I mean, we've <laughs> we've done it. Hey, here's a fun little trivia fact, though. I might actually be related to Robert Louis Stevenson. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, my uh my 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 grandmother is from England and uh, and her maiden name is Stevenson and and kind of from the same region. I don't know, I've never done the ancestry cheek swab thing to find <laughs> out all that stuff, but um that yeah. would be pretty cool though. I remember she yeah, she told me that when I was a kid. Huh. She saw me reading this. She's like, "I don't know, but he might be my great great uncle or something like that. I don't know. She doesn't even sound like that if she ever hears this, she's going to beat me upside the head now." Yeah. Well, I feel like <laughs> that, yeah, uh, some of the things that we've imitated, I'm sure would not make some people happy, you know, <laughs> our voices or anything like that. Let's, uh, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the, uh, um, the namesake of the film. Yeah. We uh, kind of skipped over we the can, entire Van Helsing, we? uh, either Abraham Van Helsing for like the, the purists of Dracula or in the movie, Gabriel Van Helsing. Mm-hmm. I just want to hear about Gabriel. This whole left hand of God business, <laughs> I am down. I want to know more. Well, yeah. So <laughs> Tell me more. The, the, the Van Helsing part of his name definitely comes from Bram Stoker's Dracula. But if you read that book, he's not a vampire hunter. He's not an adventurer. He's not. I mean, he's like a he's a doctor, right? He's like, oh, a, he's like a super doctor. Oh, yeah, he's the most intelligent doctor. He's got, like, 12 letters after his yeah, name. Yeah, exactly. Ah, uh, that's right. So he's, they and call him in when um, Mina is getting all sick. Lucy. 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 And then Mina. And Isn't it Mina. Lucy Western Raw? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, you and, remember uh, this better than I do. The whole reason that uh, Dr. Van Helsing and Dr. Seward, who is Mina's father, uh, know each other is because Dr. Seward uh, helped... Van Helsing one time when he had gangrene or something like that. I don't know. It's, it, I haven't read the book for a while, but that's pretty much how they all met. And then the Van Helsing comes in when Mina and Lucy start getting Ill. eaten. Yeah. But at, as different adaptations of the Dracula story developed over time, Van Helsing became cooler and cooler and, and then he turned into Hugh Jackman. And, and so, yeah, he's the reached ultimate. peak coolness, obviously. <laughs> You're not going to get better than that. So uh, now he's often portrayed as, as like the hero, the, mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the cool guy. And so uh, this one the has inspiration him. for spinoffs like Stan Helsing. Stan. Wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, it's a movie. I, okay, I am not aware. Movie night. Oh boy, Stan Helsing. I hope that it's as wonderfully horrible as the scary oh, movies. You'll be surprised. Well, anyway, so Gabriel Van Helsing in the movie is uh, yeah he he doesn't remember much. He he remembers fighting at Masada, which was this um, uh, this battle from you know centuries before the the, the movie takes place, but. Uh, they, for some reason, nobody thinks that's weird. Uh, they just kind of shrug and say, yeah, whatever. But by the end of the movie, you, you really, it, it, I don't remember if it comes right out and says it, or if it just basically implies it as heavily as it can without explicitly stating that this is Gabriel, the angel who has been cast to earth and doesn't remember, uh, his his real past mm-hmm. so the the church is using him as a uh, as, as as a weapon against evil to kill all of these evil things um but yeah gabriel is a is an angel he's one of the two angels in the bible that's actually named gabriel along with michael and there are other angels that show up in other writings from uh you know the ancient world that have names like Raphael and uriel but in, in 
Uh, in the Bible, Gabriel never is recorded as fighting. Michael's the one who's kind of associated mm-hmm. with fighting in the Bible, but Gabriel is the one who appears to Mary and delivers messages about how you know she's going to have a baby. But in other writings from the time period, you do find Gabriel being described as sitting at the left hand of God. And uh, I'm thinking here of a book called Second Enoch. If you look at Second Enoch, oh, it's chapter 24, I think. And I have it somewhere in my notes. But uh, Enoch is, is welcomed into the throne room of God and says, here, God tells him, sit here, sit here at my left hand. Uh, with Gabriel and uh, in the in the Bible there's no mention ever of God's left hand really having any kind of importance Um, God's right hand is mentioned as being a place where Jesus sits Mm -hmm. and so uh, as as the you kind of have these different disparate ideas meshing together the the idea becomes the the right hand is where the good things are and the left hand is where the bad things are or the left hand is where love and or excuse me the right hand is where love and mercy is going to sit and the left hand is where pain and judgment is going to sit oh, okay. yeah it's starting to sound a little more familiar yeah like in our movie right where the left hand of god is this this weapon of judgment of god's judgment and uh, you know fighting evil even when he doesn't remember it, so but there, that, that's a that's about as as far as as I think I can really go with that. I mean, it's uh, it's it's another one of those places like Lilith that's coming out of Jewish yeah. um, mystic literature. I mean, Se- Second Enoch is a it's a really interesting book filled with all sorts of ideas <laughs> about um, uh, th- th- this sort of thing. So tell me this though, what uh, what would you change about this movie? What would I change? Yeah, oh yeah. Is... man, it was okay for kind of like a Halloween movie. It was way too action based for me. Okay, like I, I felt like a summer blockbuster, mm-hmm. and not that there's anything wrong with that. They're entertaining and stuff, but I feel like it would have done better. Uh, if it was a little more, uh, a little more Dracula, less last action hero. You know, I'm actually okay with that. I th- I think I was going into it expecting more of a of an action movie, so I, I got exactly what okay. I was expecting. I mean, yeah, if you're expecting this to be a horror film, and you know, I guess they do kind of lead you to think that with that opening scene. You remember how it's in black and white? Yeah. The, yeah. It, so it's it's really intentionally channeling the old universal horror film. So I, I which I love. A, sure. Yeah, but I get. I guess it could be a bit of a bait and switch because it is not a horror film. It, yeah. it is absolutely blockbuster. Punch him up. Make jokes about it. <laughs> and you have Carl the Friar that. <laughs> <laughs> and you have Carl the Friar, who is just is the comedic relief. He's the sidekick. Yeah, he's the Q of Van Helsing. He's yeah, that's true. <laughs> he's he develops all this fun gadgetry, and uh, I don't know. He's just he's just fun, and uh, you know, and I, I enjoy it. It's it's a lot of fun. But I w- I gotta say, I love. I, I said it earlier in the podcast that you know at the time I had only seen you know, a couple of, Mm -hmm. and I only knew about some of the universal monsters. Now I've seen every one of their movies, at least a dozen times. I I love the black and white old universal movies. Uh, in fact, I've watched the, the English Dracula and the Spanish Dracula, which I got to say the Spanish Dracula Hmm. is better. Oh yeah. Are Are you watching it with subtitles? Yeah. Oh wow. I mean, it says it's, pretty much exactly the same thing, but it's just, I don't know, better put together, Hmm. more put together. Interesting. And just, it's a delight to watch. And, uh, but yeah, I would love to see some more of that old horror movie from like the thirties, forties, because I don't know, I, I have a soft spot for those, just the nostalgia from watching that first five minutes. I was like, yay. Oh, Oh, (laughs) and it just turned into, Shoot him up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but what would what would you end up changing? Well, I I think 
because I was expecting it to be this kind of cheesy action film. Uh, I didn't really have very many expectations. <laughs> like when they, especially by the end, when they they just can they figure out how to get to the castle through the uh, through the map or through through the mirror and and then he just happens to they, to be able to jump them over the gate and, yeah. and they just happen to be able to find powers. the the cure. All of that just really convenient plot that's going on I'm like yeah sure whatever <laughs> just get back to punching because that's clear that that's kind of what i'm figuring this movie is going to be about i think it would have been interesting if they could have done something a little uh, a, a little deeper and i'm not i'm not sure why i i do think that it was kind of nice that she um that they actually killed characters i i i respect uh, a storyteller who can do that um I, Who's that, not afraid to lose an audience because of that? That would have that would have been entirely stereotypical, right? If they had not killed the female mm. lead and allow, and and then they would have kissed and ridden off into the sunset together, and all of that, like that would have really been uh, just cheesy. <laughs> um, action movie stereotypes out, out, out every orifice. But, uh, so I'm glad they didn't do that. Uh, I, I know that's not answering your question, but I, I guess I don't really, I hadn't, I didn't really have It's good for what it change. is. It's yeah, really, exactly. really well done for what it is. It's like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Like, it's not fancy, but it's satisfying. I mean, I'm, I'm happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, here, here's the, the last question I have for you. It, it, if, if there was a gigantic uh, celebrity grudge match between mm. Van Helsing and John McClane, yeah. who would you put your money on? Are we talking to Abraham Van Helsing or Gabriel uh, No, we're Van talking Helsing. Gabriel Van Helsing. Okay. I don't the know. The left hand of God. That's pretty legit. But you know. with, with um, they, they get the same weapons, though. Okay. Yeah, because obviously Van Helsing has Carl. So if, if, um, <laughs> if John McClane had Carl's weaponry at his disposal, too. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's difficult because uh, I'm pretty sure Gabriel it would just wallop on John McClane, but John McClane would take it. Yeah, he would be he would walk out of that you know rough pr- looking pretty rough but he would be fine <laughs> and you know some sharp stick to the side of the head to gabriel van helsing and okay movie over <laughs> so, so you think they'd, they'd fight to a draw i think they would fight to about a draw and and then they would go just and because, have a drink together i'm sure oh probably just because one of them's like so like just goes on the offensive and just attacks and attacks and attacks but if you look at John McClane, it's just like <laughs> defense, defense, defense. Oh, all, right, all right. Yeah, I guess it would kind of be like Thor fighting Hulk, wouldn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, okay, I'm satisfied with that. Yeah, the little, a little nod to Ragnarok there. Hey, uh, <laughs> that'll be next month. Yay. So, Garrett, is there anybody that you would uh, blah, 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 recommend this movie to? Anyone and everyone that's like 14 years old or older. I feel like if you're younger than that, you might get a little freaked out, personally. <laughs> I did like, not watch this with my daughters, I will say that. That's probably a good idea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Especially with the teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Oof, with that opera singer. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, I think it would be, it's a good movie, especially around Halloween, because, you know, it takes place around Halloween, mm-hmm. and uh, it's also a vampire werewolf slash Frankenstein movie. So yeah. got the whole unholy trifecta of mo- movie monsters. Here. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So um, I just think it's a good movie to watch around this time of year. Mm. Hang out, have fun, drink some green punch or something. I don't know. Some some pumpkin spice lattes. <gasps> PSLs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the hour. Thanks for joining us today on The Story Cauldron. The music for this episode is from the band Hook Sounds. Uh, if you like what you've heard, uh, you can find more on Instagram and Twitter at The Story Cauldron or Story Cauldron. We've got a website, uh, thestorycauldron.com. And don't forget to rate us on iTunes and leave a review. We prefer positive things because it makes us... Uh, it just makes us happy. <laughs> <laughs> and it helps other people find our podcast and just let, lets us know that you care. Um, So here's until next time. Bye. Bye.